So we're going to talk about unaccountable loneliness or farts. Um, I thought this was the best of the three Camelot plays that I've read thus far. Uh, I thought that the quote from Isley was very resonant from the dream animal. I also think that, uh, that this is a, a, a great example of deconstruction where you, instead of having Guinevere, Lancelot, you have Guinevere as essentially uh, a slut and Lancelot as th this idiot who thinks that he's in love with, Guine with Guinevere mainly because she has status versus, uh, how do you pronounce it, Isolt or Gisolt? Iso, Iso, Iso. Iso. Uh, versus Iso, who he, he doesn't think much of, versus Guinevere. Well, I, I don't think Guinevere is portrayed as a sl slut. I mean, one of the things we get to find out here is that he only had one night with Lancelot. In my version of this, uh, of this mythos, She's not having some great romance with Lancelot. She has had one night with him, and she finds him to be rather dull and uh, whatnot. Mm -hmm. He's a good-looking guy. He's a, apparently a great knight, but it's like, yeah, he's not that bright. There's though. no melodrama either. Arthur doesn't care yeah. uh, that he had this fling with Lancelot. Um, and she excuses it by saying that Arthur has had many maidens. She can have a, a tryst here or there. And she also is seen as some kind of, it's, it sort of modernizes uh, the Arthurian world where because she is, and she has dalliances, it, it, it inspires, at least according to uh, Morgan Le Fay, um, that she may inspire other little girls, I guess, to be more open with themselves or something like that, some bizarre lesson. Uh, um, but I thought that this was uh, probably the most interesting of the three plays that I read, especially because of the stage direction, there's these multicolored stage lights that come on. It sort of reminded me of Antonioni and the Red Desert, but taken to uh, even uh, greater heights mm -hmm. where you have these the sort of mood lights uh, each that uh, light each of the scenes. And I thought that it was uh, an ex excellent example of using stage direction to complexify the dialogue. Um, well, give a little bit of thought to that, too. I think Merlin, too, if he is in the second play at all, um, it's mainly just a cameo or a mention, whereas this one, he has a, a larger part advising Arthur. Well, this is Guinevere's play. She's, in a, essence, the main character. Um, and uh, she, this play doesn't use any music. The last play was filled with music. Gawain, the, the interior of Gawain, we, I was using music to music and emotional tools to sketch out the the mind of Gawain, which I should have mentioned when I was talking about that play. But that's that's an interesting thing because music is not an intellectual thing; it's an emotional art, and it's used to scan him out. Here, lighting does it. There's no music in this play, and I wanted to have it sort of be absolutely silent in terms of there's, there's no music. The other two plays use some music here and there, but this one is, is silent, and uh, uh, you know we get we get uh, more uh, more about uh, the the uh, what you call the uh, the mythic uh, romances of the Arthurian law, but uh, we find out that they're not really that much. Mm -hmm. I, that's a that's a good point too. I mean the the romances in Arthurian lore too are are largely overdone. I've seen it, them in uh, several versions, and here again, like I said, it's not longingly saying Guinevere, uh, Lancelot. It's just more of a it it it's more as 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 a tool to sketch out Guinevere's internals, the same as Lancelot, who doesn't really have that much for internals. Uh, also interesting is that you have used Sir Gawain as the greatest uh, knight of Arthur's court versus uh, Lancelot, who I, I'm not an expert on Arthurian mythos by any, uh, but is probably the most well-known of the knights um, and is sometimes sketched to be the great heroic figure when he was really just in it for a romance with Guinevere. Well, I mean, Lancelot is a, a later edition. I think I mentioned that 
a month or two ago when we talked about the first play uh, in this quintet that uh, there's uh, the early romances, there's the Vulgate cycle, what it's called, and the post Vulgate cycle. Then you get Tennyson, uh, well, you get Mallory as part of the post Vulgate cycle, I believe. Then you get Tennyson, and then you get modern people like T.H. White and Marion Zimmer Bradley who redid the myths. Um, but usually uh, they stick kind of, they, they'll, they'll, they stick mostly to what came before. They don't, they might make someone who is a cousin into a half brother or, or something like that. And I do a little bit of that too, but I, but I have refigured most of the myth here. Here, uh, we, we are getting a portrait of the women. This is, this is the most female centric uh, of the Arthurian plays. Most of my plays, most of the, the other plays of mine, uh, aside from the three great cons plays, uh, there's a lot of great women characters here. Uh, there's not as much, I mean, there's Morgos, there's Morgan, there's Guinevere, there's a so, and there's a few minor female characters, cooks or, or maids or whatnot that bandying about, but it's mostly a male world. And uh, uh, so this is, this is uh, just trying to uh, put Guinevere uh, and, and sort of redeem her in the sense that she isn't a slut. Uh, just like Gawain was, I think, it was wrong to demote him from the, the top knight status, since I think Gawain and the, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight is the greatest uh, of the Arthurian uh, mythoses. Uh, Guinevere uh, is short shrifted. Is so uh, is short shrifted. And I, I I wanted to do something more of the persona thing here with the mixing uh, up of them. Uh, and with, there's there's scenes later on where we get. Uh, them speaking in different voices. The watcher speaks as a so, uh, um, and so forth. And uh, I, I wanted to that is, that is uh, one of the best scenes in any of your plays, uh, where you have the characters speaking in different voices, and uh, you realize that Guinevere is an older version of so, at least emotionally. Um, you, I mean. That that uh, that scene is just a tour de force of uh, drama, uh, where you you have those characters speaking in different voices. It would be, I think it may be difficult to stage or get the uh, minutia of it right, but it would be uh, you know these these plays even as literature you really want to see them on stage to see how differently they would be portrayed mm -hmm. versus um, I was talking to Thomas he was telling me about. Um, O'Neill and, and that type of stuff. And O'Neill's stage direction uh, generally devolves down to I want uh, a, a, a few books put on these shelves, these specific books. And I find that his stage direction, if he would have just cut it down to character one interacts with character two, his plays would have been a little better because he tends to go over along with the, the exposition. But the character dynamics are really great. Um, your stage direction has more purpose to it. Um, yes, sometimes you have a lot of poems and a lot of reused material, but for the most part, the stage direction, like with the mood lighting here, um, really works. Um, yeah, and I, like I said, I didn't want to use any music here. It has to be the the, the mood and whatnot. So, because uh, Gawain was using music, an emotional tool, to get into the intellect uh, of uh, the, the the thoughts of uh, Gawain, here we're using a more intellectual thing, lighting that uh, yeah. that's going to be more precise, and we're sort of trying to scope out Guinevere stuff. Um, and we know that Guinevere is not the most pleasant person. Uh, before we had st uh, started talking, or, uh, or maybe early in the other play, you had mentioned Sir Dagonet, who's a minor character, the court jester, and uh, in, in this play, in the fourth play especially, uh, Dagonet is a character uh, that I just ran with. Dagonet in this in this quintet is sort of like a Norwegian, the Norwegian or Big Frank was in Vincetti Brothers. In that I knew once I had once I got the first exchange between Guinevere and Dagonet, I knew I had a really great thing here. And what eventually happens, just to to preview it, is in we find out that there is more sexual tension between Dagonet and Guinevere than there ever was between Lancelot and Guinevere. So in my reinterpretation, uh, Dagonet uh, and his hostility, his, his sort of love-hate relationship with Guinevere, 
uh, there is actually some love and respect between the two of them um, that is that in maybe a different uh, timeline, uh, Dagene might have ended up with Guinevere uh, because they do have a they do have that what in the 19, late twentieth century a lot of television shows in America had that chemistry between seemingly two incompatible people, Sam and Diane from Cheers, or uh, the two characters from Moonlighting, a TV show with Bruce Willis and uh, what's her name, the the one from Taxi Driver, um, uh, Sybil Shepherd. Sybil Shepherd, yeah. Um, uh, so we, we have that here and I knew, I knew that Dagene was a way to grieve because there's a, a, in an early scene, you know, uh, he's caught eavesdropping on them by the king and he, and, and basically he ends up turning it around after uh, uh, some humorous exchanges. He's, he's like, well, of course I was eavesdropping king, uh, for, for me to know you and to know what makes you, you know, find things funny. I have to know all about you. So of course I have to eavesdrop you. And authors are like, you know, that kind of makes sense. And Arthur, Arthur, we get we get a deeper sense of Arthur here too. And the thing in all five of the plays, and here you have to, to play three, we we get that Arthur is a very complex character, but he's not the typical hero. Yes, he, he seemingly is capable of being heroic. We we'll, we see that in play one and play five. But in the three middle plays, uh, he he's well here, like you had mentioned here, he's like. I think it's either in this play or in the next play, he says something along like, I'm kind of glad that Guinevere had that affair with Launcelot because, you know, that now that means she can't use that to, to guilt trip me. Uh, he's sort of sleeping on his laurels, too. He, yeah. was the great, uh, he was the great um, conqueror in the first play, and now he's sort of just resting to the ease of being a king. Um, and letting his, his knights get the glory. Well, and he also says at some point, I think in this play it is, or maybe at the, somewhere in one of these plays, he says something along the lines of, oh yeah, being a king is great here. You know, I get all, all the women I want. You know, it's, it, I, I like being a king. It's, it's not the um, perfect version of Arthur by any means. 